Probably good. Um, let me start by introducing you and then I'll turn it over to you and okay. that will be our editing point. So good evening everyone. Um, I'm happy to have Gary Steger join us tonight. I've known Gary for, I don't know, 10 years or so and his co-author Sylvia Martinez of the book Invent to Learn. Uh, Gary is an incredibly experienced educator who has no opinions whatsoever and um, I'm really excited for him to share some of his ideas and his experiences related to staff development with my technology um, and education 575 students tonight. Uh, Gary has worked with some of the world's best people related to technology and education. Uh, he's taught at Pepperdine University. Um, he's, he's done a lot of different things and I'll let him introduce himself a little bit further so you get an idea of what he's all about. So welcome Gary, we're really glad to have you here tonight. Thanks for the invitation Lucy, I appreciate it. It's great to be with everyone. Um, I'm indeed Gary Steger, and I've been working in educational technology for the last 36 years, um, trying to help teachers make sense out of wondrous opportunities that exist um, for knowledge construction with the new materials and technology that continuously emerge. Um, not just to teach kids things that we've always wanted them to know with greater efficiency or efficacy or comprehension, but to create opportunities for kids to learn and do um, and explore domains of knowledge that, that were unimaginable just a couple of years ago. I've actually been teaching teachers um, to be better teachers and to use constructive technology in their teaching since I was about 19 years old, um, long before I had a degree. And I've taught everything from preschool through the doctoral level. I created Pepperdine University's online master's degree program in educational technology 20 years ago. Um, 27 and a half years ago, I led professional development at the first two schools in the world where every kid had a laptop. And from the time I was about 19 to 30, I led a, I was responsible for professional development for a consortium of 150 computer using school districts in New Jersey. Um, so I've worked freelance as a professional developer and speaker and author and consultant almost my entire career. So I have some, some pretty well formed thoughts on what I think makes effective PD um, and some of them might be might differ from conventional wisdom but that'll be an opportunity for us to, to have a bit of a conversation um, so I whipped together very quickly and I'm sure there's typos in it um, 13 lucky principles for for effective PD and if you can see the slides I'll just I'll just go through them quickly and and share some of some of the ideas that shape my work and my perspectives on on teaching teachers and then we can have um, a vigorous discussion. So the first idea is that learning is natural and that learning is a verb. Um, in a lot of the rhetoric about education today, learning is a noun, it's, it's something that, that you hope you can expose kids to. It's some sort of contagion you throw into a classroom and provide access to the learning, pull the door sh shut real quick and hope it spreads. Um, but the learner learns and learning is natural. It's part of being human. And, and the, the fewer barriers we erect to, to learning being natural, um, the better the learning occurs. The second is the idea that frames all of my work, whether it's thinking about learning or teaching or curriculum development or assessment. And it comes from Jean Piaget and that is that knowledge is a consequence of experience and that there's no substitute for experience. There's research coming out of places like Stanford that are demonstrating that if students have an experience before they watch a lecture, see a film, read a chapter in a book, um, they have a deeper understanding than if that order is reversed. And a lot of my work, I think, has demonstrated that, perhaps not empirically yet, but that um, in a lot of cases, the experience can actually substitute for instruction. The, the next idea is that you, you can't be, behave, believe that children are competent if you behave as if teachers are incompetent. Um, we have to stop infantilizing teachers and, and treating them in a paternalistic fashion, particularly when it comes to PD. And I think the three great lies that teachers tell are, I need more PD, um, mm -hmm. I, I use lesson plans, and I need curriculum. Um, it's a mistake that every company that's peddling stuff to schools thinks they need to they need to address. Um, but in fact, I think all three are kind of fibs. And in fact, there's an insatiable desire for PD, which which often is on the 
the edge of, of helplessness or being sincere. Um, it kind of teeters between those two extremes. But uh, my sense is that folks who say they need PD, there's almost no amount of PD you could provide that would satiate that desire. Um, the next idea is that PD should be experienced as close to practice as possible, which means the best PD happens in teachers' classrooms with the teacher so they can see through the eyes and the hands and the screens of their kids what's possible. They can see it with their own kids. It, it allows them to suspend their disbelief and have um, greater, greater sense of what's possible. Now, this also applies to conferences, and it's one of my great criticisms of national and international conferences, things like the ISTE conference, and that is that when you're running tips and tricks sessions at the national or international level, um, it's not only not as effective as doing it as close to the school practice as possible, but it actually cannibalizes all the PD that's provided down the food chain. And it actually harms the affiliate organizations. And as I said a moment ago, I think it's less effective. So the closer the PD can be to where the teacher teaches, I think the better. Um, the most effective work that I've been involved with, and, and it's one of the reasons why schools have laptops today, is that in the early 90s, I spent up to three months at a time in a school or multiple schools um, working into classrooms and saying, hey, why don't you try this? Or, hey, what are you doing? Why don't you try it another way? Or um, modeling for teachers what was possible with their students in the context in which they work. Um, the next big idea is that PD should always be focused on benefiting children. Um, that, that seems obvious, but a lot of PD, particularly around technology, is associated with doing things with technology that you don't like doing in the first place, typically clerical chores, report writing, grade book programs, et cetera. Now, from an administrative position, if a teacher's figuring, having trouble figuring out how to use their online grade book, Tell them to hire the seven-year-old next door. This, this, shouldn't be a, 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 this shouldn't be a reason for concern. The best PD helps teachers learn with the tools in the way that you want the kids to learn. And, and you can come up with other strategies for if you want to learn how to write a newsletter or type, you know, communicate with parents or enter grades, you can send someone off to do something. Um, an online course, a local community college, you know, what, you know, community ed classes, but the professional development should be consistent with the educational vision for what happens in classrooms. The next idea may be slightly controversial, and that is that there's zero benefit in giving technology to the teachers first. This is an idea that's been repeated over and over and over again and never works. The notion that we're going to get laptops next year, um, and before the kids get them, we're going to give them to the teachers. Uh, teachers are busy. Um, when you give the technology to the teachers first, you give license to the system to use the technology for chores the teachers don't like doing in the first place. Um, and there's nothing more effective than letting teachers see through the eyes and the hands and the screens of the kids what's possible. You have to start from the assumption that teachers love their kids, love the students, and that you want them they want the best for them and they want to use technology in a way that benefits them. Um, so I've seen no benefit anywhere in the world to giving the technology to the, to the teachers first. And by the way, we're now 40 years into microcomputers being in schools. There's, it's inexcusable that a teacher doesn't know how to use a computer for basic functions. Um, I was hanging out with my 96 year old friend, Sal last week on a cruise ship. Sal can email, he can use Facebook, he can attach documents, he can share photos, he can use mess Messenger. I assure you, there's, he's attended zero after-school workshops. I assure you there's been no NSF money involved in teaching Sal to use social media. Um, it, it's insulting to teachers, and it's been counterproductive to have such low expectations for what, um, for what teachers can do with technology. I'm going to get to that point some more in a moment. Um, an idea that I've stolen verbatim from my friend, the great Deborah Meyer, and that is teacher working conditions or student learning conditions. I should say student learning conditions. Teacher working conditions or student learning conditions. Um, that the, when we say we're going to put kids first, it kind of marginalizes teachers. And we want everyone learning at the same time in the environment. And when we, when we dismiss the concerns and the comfort um, and the professionalism of teachers, 
then I think we're, we're short shrift, giving short shrift to kids as, as well. Um, as I mentioned a moment ago, we have to assume that teachers love their kids. And when they can see that the technology or any intervention that, that you want to bring into classrooms benefits the kids, then that I, I find more often than not, teachers are willing to embrace that change. Um, now, <laughs> the counter example should be more true as well, which is when teachers see things thrown at them that they know harms children. I wish they would speak up and fight back and, and resist more. The next idea is that we need to raise expectations and stop nurturing helplessness. How many more tech coaches are we going to hire? Um, how many more workshops on tweeting are we going to offer for teachers before, before they can use a computer like everyone else in society? I mean, I have, I have serious concerns that, that the profession of teaching is now attracting folks um, like, you know, the Amish or something, people who don't want to use electricity and don't want to engage with modernity. And it's irresponsible. It doesn't set a good example as learners. Um, it, it creates an artificial boundary and barrier between the world of the kids and, and, and the classroom. And that's ultimately disrespectful of kids and limits, limits their potential. Like I said, I, I, I don't know any civilian who has required iPad training or social media training. Um, and yet we continuously spend a fortune on systems to keep, keep teachers from using computers um, in ways that they would want to use them in, in a productive sense to benefit their kids um, and to teach them things that they should have figured out on their own. The next idea is that training is for circus animals. Um, the truth be told, I don't particularly believe in instruction. Um, but to the extent that you believe in instruction, um, I think training is kind of a toxic term for what we do to, to teachers or kids. You can imagine someone with a chair and a whip forcing folks um, to do something against their will. I think PD is most effective when you take off your teacher hat and put on your learner hat, when you're selfish with the experience, when you can let go of the fact that your principal is a jerk or you have to do carpool duty in 15 minutes or whatever. That, um, when you're when you're in in a in a meaningful context, a productive context for learning, that's the most effective PD. And the last idea is that PD should in, inspire teachers to continue learning on their own. Um, Lucy knows that I've I've been really disappointed and vocally outspoken about the fact that the SD conference doesn't care very much about the keynote speakers they hire or the program they assemble. And a lot of conferences don't particularly care about their program. They care a lot more about the, about the exhibit hall. And, and what really infuriates me about that and what really guides my work is the realization that a teacher might get to go to a conference every five or 10 years. If someone's going to be able to leave their classroom every five or 10 years, you better blow their freaking minds. You have an obligation to, to set them on fire, set their hair on fire, so they continue to learn on their own after they return um, from the event. And, and that goes for PD as well. The, the notion that you can teach everyone everything in whatever amount of time is, is silly, but um, we, we really need to take seriously the idea that there needs to be a beginning, middle, and end. When I speak at a conference or I lead PD somewhere, I operate for, on the assumption that I'm never gonna see these people again. So, so they have to have a whole narrative. They have to have a sense of why they might do this. They might need a, a minimal amount of, to get started um, and then enough inspiration to continue learning on their own. So that's kind of my sermonette. Um, if I can I'll figure out how to turn the screen off for now, or, or does it matter? Probably doesn't uh, matter. If you want to leave them up, you can, or you can. No, no. Okay. Uh, let me I think those turn, put my glasses on and, and... I'll say pause share. Does that do it? Or stop share. Stop share. There we go. There we go. Oh, I love what you just said. Those, I, I agree with just about all of those. Um, we actually could look at the, I wish, can you send the slide? I wonder if there's a way to send the slides to us because then we could look at them on our own without taking away the screen. Um, there's probably some easy way to do it. So, so <laughs> I can send it to you afterwards, which yeah, doesn't, I'm, it I'm, doesn't I'm, actually I'm, help, but I'm busy being helpless right now. Um, 
Well, you know, this technology is always funny. It always does the things nobody needs. You know, when we, when we started teaching online at Pepperdine, we used Net, Netscape news groups and tapped in for asynchronous and synchronous, in. for asynchronous and synchronous communication. And then as soon as the university got sold Blackboard, you know, Blackboard was best designed for taking tests, ratting on kids to their parents, and, and finding out whether you wanted hot or cold lunch. It was terrible for, for, for ah, it was terrible for facilitating any kind of discussion that had a lot of volume and velocity. And you know, in a twelve-week course, my my classes typically had six thousand exchanges. Um, you know, and the students would then start complaining about the software is falling over. Can you create a new room? And well, then if you create a new room, you lose the conversation that's been taking place. And you know. so, so explain to everyone what tapped in was, because that's something I haven't thought about since early in my career. <laughs> I, I thought it was like the coolest thing since life. Tapped in was a text-based text -based environment where you just went online, you saw who was there, you could say, I'm going to my office. And if other people said, I, go to Lucy's office, then the three of us would be in the office and the conversation we had would be in that office. And then there were students who put hot tubs in them and plants and stupid things I could never be bothered with. In fact, about 10, in about 10 years at Pepperdine, I never actually even had an office. They used to yell at me all the time because I held all my classes in a hallway. Um, or I would go online, just figure out where most of the students were hanging out, and then I would join them because it didn't matter to me whether I had an official was, office or not. It was kind of like an early second life yeah. virtual experience. Yeah. Yeah, it was better than Second Life because it didn't require you to do anything. Um, <laughs> it just it just plain worked. I mean, you know, and and this is this is you know off the the topic slightly, but um, one of the reasons why sometimes I feel like the the old grumpy get off my lawn guy is the first online conference I participated in was in 1985. Um, so I knew all the social media hype was bunk. I, you know, I, I, you may have seen I tweeted a few weeks ago that I hope in 2018 there'll be a truth and reconciliation um, tribunal where, where people can apologize for saying that social media would transform education. Um, you, know, that, you know, we're kind of at the point where surely that was baloney, right? Um, and I, I don't think it's transformed education, but it's trim, it, it has given access to people, to people on ideas that maybe normally they wouldn't have, but it could be any kind of vehicle. Yeah, yeah. You could say listservs back in the day did that, right? Um, but I, I don't, oh, right. I don't change education. It hasn't changed the inherent structure and uh, problems that exist, I think, in schools. But well, and, it's, done, and, it's, it's given teachers a voice more, I think. Somewhat. And it, it kind of, yeah, it kind of, <laughs> dumbed down expectations in some ways. I mean, a lot of this information was in things like books and putting on pants and going somewhere and meeting other people. And, um, you know, so I, I, you, you do know that this was hyped, right? I mean, you'd come yes. on, right? I, right? I, think, you know. I, think, I, I think tools, I mean, I think, I think what I find disturbing now is you know, you're talking about conferences and what they want and, um, it, I, I feel if you, I, I think the conference speakers is, is who's popular on the conference circuit now. And outside of ed tech, I'm not sure if these people would be getting so much attention. You know what I mean? Like they're- No, 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 ed tech is a- thing. And ed tech's a special case. Ed yeah. tech's the only place where they're selling anything, um, right? Ed tech is, you know, ed tech is different in a lot of ways, right? And, and there's a lot of folks who are popular speakers in ed tech who I can't figure out what the tech does. Like I, my, my work in my work, it, my work is inseparable from using computers for making tinkering, engineering, inventing things. Um, the, 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 the thing I said about social media was the reason why I wasn't so impressed or excited was it's just a dial tone. Like to the extent that Twitter and Facebook and all these other things work, they should be just completely transparent. They're just talking. And schools are good at talking, right? That's what schools do. 98% of what happens in schools is language arts, regardless of what, you know, math class in most cases is just vocabulary acquisition. It's not actual mathematics. So schools are really good at talking. So we had a new channel for talking. Okay, fine. 
that, you know, I, I knew it wasn't going to transform anything. And then, like I said, when we spent PD resources on teaching teachers to use something you could teach a, a gorilla to use um, or a gorilla could figure out on their own, it seemed like a, a misdirection. It seemed like a detour. It seemed like we, we wasted a decade. Um, so what would, so here's a question for you. What would, what would a, your ideal PD look like? And you might want to talk about that in the context of CPA yeah. because that's really kind of your. Well, where, I'll talk about, I'll talk about, I'll talk about everything we do. And in fact, we were spent an afternoon packing because we're doing something tomorrow somewhere in the world. Um, <laughs> then I'm coming home and then going to, to India. I'm going to India, Italy, and Australia for over a month. Oh, um, okay. So, um, you know, in our one day PD, we usually start with a talk to sort of frame the discussion and because people like being talked at. Um, but then when it comes to actually doing something, I'm obsessed with the question of what's the smallest seed I can plant that generates the largest blossom that creates the most beautiful garden. And so if we're using the hummingbird robotic sets, um, I'll ask people to build a vending machine or make a bird. And in an hour or two, anywhere in the world, regardless of teacher's prior experience, they figure out how to build something, how to deal with gears, how to deal with motors and sensors and servos, how to program, how to debug, all without direct instruction. And that experience is hopefully mind-blowing enough for them that they start thinking about what they do when they endlessly prepare and create rubrics and step-by-step -step nonsense that would take people two years to achieve what we do with three minutes of, of you know, with a, with a prompt that you could write on a post-it note. Um, the materials we use are based on the idea that knowledge is a consequence of experience. We didn't write curricular materials before we started doing workshops. We did workshops and then we created materials that were the minimum required to help people get started um, and be successful if we were running around in another corner of the room. I did a workshop for Virginia ASCD in December for 150 teachers hands-on, me alone, 150. Um, and, and so uh, that's because I know how to do this. I have some experience. I set the materials up. I created the environment. I provided just the right amount of paper, which is never more than one or two sides of a sheet of paper to get started with particular technology. We give the people a good prompt and then they can be successful. Um, so I, I, I think that a lot of what happens in teaching in general is, is hampered by over planning. And I think the most successful learning is, is a result of, of some unplanning of the allowing for things to breathe, allowing for serendipity, of anticipating that, of not being arrogant enough to think that you know what every student's going to do every time, um, but but also having the experience and the expertise to recognize there are certain certain bugs that people are going to hit over and over and over again, or intuitions about how to solve problems they might not have seen before. Um, there's one thing I do. We often use turtle art, which is this wonderful sort of self-contained world for communicating mathematical ideas to the computer and drawing beautiful pictures with it. It's a version of Logo, but it's a really nice self-contained piece of software that doesn't require a great deal of instruction. And if you have forward and right, you can draw anything in the universe. And when I, one of the, one of the activities is giving the people some, some cards with programs already written on them and it's block-based programming and the blocks to connect in order to create the image. And there's a particular order you need to follow in so much as if you have, if, if there's a block called Lucy, you have to have, have defined that block Lucy somewhere else. So the way you define a procedure and give it the name Lucy is you put a hat on the top of it and you type the word Lucy on it. And I tell people now, I'm going to tell you something very important. I'm going to tell it to you and I'm going to tell it to you over and over again. I'm going to tell it to you five or six times. Hats first, hats first, hats first, hats first. The reason why we have to have hats first is because unless you put the hat first and name the procedure, you won't have the block created that you can use in the other part of the program for, gener for running that procedure. So I'm going to tell you all that. I'm going to tell you again, hats first, hats first, hats first, hats first. 
And within the next three minutes, one of you is going to say, how come I don't have that block? And it's ne it never fails. I mean, it, I, I'm sort of making fun of um, Madeline Hunter. I don't know if you're from, you remember, you know. I, I was training Madeline Hunter when I was in. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm kind of mocking that, right? Because I'm going to, I tell them, I do a little dance. I say hats first. And I jump, jump around. And sure enough, two minutes later, someone says, how come this doesn't work? And, and, and what, I, what I point out with that is that I've just demonstrated the limits of instruction, right? That until you had the experience where the block you needed wasn't there because you hadn't named a sequence of steps somewhere else, I could have told you that until I was blue in the face. Knowledge is a consequence of experience. You had the context, you had the experience, now you understand it. And, and so I... I, I, we often, you know, we start with a simple seed, we provide good materials, we try to lay the room out in a way that makes some sense. But, you know, I, I often joke with Sylvia, there's four versions of our generic workshop, except there's really 400 based on, you know, where the outlets are and whether people showed up with real computers or not and all that kind of stuff, whether there's 100 people or 12. Um, but with, with, a, with, a, with a good prompt and minimal support, supporting materials, um, and creating a context where they're learning like you want their students to learn, and then maybe a little discussion of, of it afterwards, um, I, I think we accomplish a great deal. I, we actually say on our website that no post-it notes are harmed in any of our PD. Um, I've, I don't, if you ever catch me using a post-it note in a workshop, or at least in a way that it's supposed to be used, you know, you can just smack me in the head. Um, the least effective PD in the world is the, hey, what do you want to know? Hey, what do you want to do? Um, I, I have a lot of friends who retire really angry because they spent their career working with teachers along those lines. I think there's a responsibility to, to know something, to have a point of view, to have some expertise, and to share that with teachers in a way that, that they can have a rich experience. Um, but asking people to choose from what they haven't seen, what they don't understand, what they haven't experienced seems seems counterproductive so do you ever have anybody who pushes back who like wants a linear step-by-step -step kind of mode i mean we were talking about this with martin last week and he's working on some pd workshops where yeah. they've kind of designed them fairly loosely and with minimal you know resources like you're suggesting um, but there's always somebody who wants the do this, do that method. And so they have it there if they want to do that. I mean, he, he recommends kind of designing things so that for the people who need the hand holding, maybe that's there, but then there's other options. There's some differentiation for the people who don't want that or need that, who want to go explore things on their own. Um, so do you, do you, I'm well, curious, do you, yeah, you just who you, can't cope with this? You, well, you just described a whole bunch of different conflicting things, right? You, the people who want to go on their own. Um, well, typically I'm working with materials that, that you could use for the next 20 years and continue to learn and grow with, right? So, so the best, and the best prompts are the ones that are, that are generative. That, and the best tools are the ones that are generative. That when people, as soon as they touch them, they have a new idea for something else they want to do, right? Um, there's a lot of stuff that we're teaching to teachers that isn't generative and a lot of things that we do with kids that aren't particularly, that aren't generative. So if, if I say, I'm going to give you a bunch of robotics materials and scratch, and I want you to build a vending machine and it drops a pen, that's a vending machine. But some people, what if two came out? Well, then you have to fix it. What if you wanted the option of buying one or two? What if you wanted a blue one or a red one? What if you want it to be coin operated? Which coin? Does it detect slugs? Should it be, should it be credit card? Can you swipe a credit card? Does it make change? Right? So that, every, so that with each success, you're, in, you're inspired to test a larger hypothesis, ask a deeper question. With, with every obstacle you, you encounter, you either have to find a way to debug the situation or work around it or redefine the problem for yourself. Um, so. As for the, I don't like this, I don't want to do this, um, sure. I mean, but that probably exists in any classroom regardless of the approach. Um, I, I think it, 
they're not interested in learning and what's good for the kids. The right, right. And, you know, and I, I think I, I meant to put up um, one of my favorite quotes from, from the Greek philosopher Xenophon, which is that nothing beautiful can ever be forced. Um, I'm a big fan of, of being, having a classroom be as non-coercive as possible. And, and I'm cool with saying, okay, don't do it. I, I, I might have other materials that I can throw to people who are more advanced or less advanced. Maybe, I'll, maybe I have a book in my bag of tricks or something that I can give them if they want to work that way or suggest to find something on the web that's step-by-step. Step. Yeah, I mean, I might, if you want to use the term differentiate in that, res, in that respect. Um, but it, it kind of surprised Sylvia when she started coming to CMK, which I'll talk about in a moment, uh, um, you know, 10 or 11 years ago. And you try to work with someone and you try to welcome them to the community of practice half a dozen times. And then at some point you just move on. Um, you know, I, I never worry about classroom management because I never go into a classroom thinking I need to manage it. And, 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 and Lucy, I could, people put me in situations that you wouldn't believe. I've taught 300 seventh graders I've never met before with five minutes notice. I've, I've done all kinds of crazy stuff, mm -hmm. you know, hands-on workshops for 150 teachers. Um, there's never a discipline problem. I walk in and say, hi, I'm Gary. Let's do something. Um, I think people see that you, you, you're coming from a good place with an open heart. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I don't, and I don't, I don't view students or teachers as kind of an opposing army. Yeah, it was um, an adversarial relationship. Yeah, it's not. No, you're right. The more we can do to, re yeah, absolutely, it's a great word. The more we can do to release, to reduce the antagonism between teachers and, and students, the better. And, and I, students, when we're talking about PD as well. I, think, I mean, I, I, think I just met a woman. About it. I think that's part what? of it is that you're fearless and you also have enough life experience where you're, 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 you're going in there and treating them as, as if they're human. And yeah, right. I think when you're, you know, I think back to when I was 21, 22 coming out of school and going into an inner city school to teach and I was terrified and it comes and kids eat that, you know, they eat it up. And when you relax and treat yeah. them um, as if they're worthwhile and they are worthwhile, uh, it, it gets to be a little bit different. And right. um, you know, I, I often say we have to, them, you're giving them obviously something interesting for them to do too. Right. I often say you have to delight in the company of the nutty kids. Um, you know, sometimes, sometimes teaching, yeah, just have to, like an athlete, you just have to have the voice in your head that says, let's see if we can raise the intensity level a little bit. Um, you know, let's, you know, the, the, the classroom feels like a wilted balloon. Let's see what we can do about that. I mean, I just had an experience three weeks ago. I flew to New Jersey and spoke at the New Jersey Educational Computing Conference, which I created 31 years ago. Not that no, anybody cares, not that anybody helped me with my stuff or didn't make me schlep it across a, a frozen tundra from a parking lot three miles away. But um, I had a woman come up to me. Ah, she must be 50 years old and said, you know, you taught my mother. And I'm like, you know, it, it, it seems preposterous. But when I was in my early 20s, there was a woman who drove an hour and a half after school every, almost three or four times a week to take any workshop I was running on anything. And it got to the point where I banned her from, from attending any more PD sessions. Cause I said, you have to actually go and do some of this before I'm going to let you back in. Um, she's now in her late eighties and I, she's a Facebook friend. And now I've met her daughter who's, you know, my age and is teaching. Um, I, I think I had good intuitions about this stuff all the way through. They've been reinforced by being able to work with people like Seymour Papert and, and Jonathan Kozel and Alfie Cohn and Deborah Meyer and any the educators of Reggie Amelia, any number of heroes that I've had the opportunity to work with. Um, but I, but I had pretty good intuitions. And I think, like you said, um, I, I'm prone to collegial relationships with kids as well as, as well as colleagues, you know, school was a terrible experience for me, K to 12. But despite that, there were always adults I could hang out with. There were always teachers I could hang out with even amongst all the chaos and bullying and everything else. Um, so I, I think that's important for kids and, and teachers as well. And I, I, I'm trying to write a book on this subject, but, but uh, the unplanning versus planning, I think, is really, really serious. You know, we just came back from my annual um, departure from real life. 
I, I was on a cruise ship for a week with a hundred of the world's greatest jazz musicians. And this year there was an 11 year old kid who was one of the passengers. And he was in a, he was in a pressed polo shirt, Ralph Lauren shirt every day and nice slacks. And he kept telling people that he was a musician. And um, by Thursday or Friday, musicians started letting him sit in. And I don't mean like wedding band musicians. I mean like multiple Grammy winners, guys who played with Sinatra, guys who played with John Coltrane. Um, and there was no scaffolding in this way. You know, schools talk about scaffolding. There was, you can come up on the bandstand because there's an expectation that you know the vocabulary and you know how to play a little bit. And they didn't treat this kid like a kid. They were, they would listen to him for a little bit and then they would throw him something a little harder and they'd get a little more complicated. And then he'd throw something back at them. And I was, and I was talking with Sylvia about it. And um, it was, it was like to use the word again, it was sort of generative. It was natural. It was flowing. And as when I was talking to one of the great musicians about it, he goes, yeah, it was jazz. That's what we do. That's what we do with adults. That's what we do with kids. There's, you know, he was part of the community of practice. He was, he had a certain level of talent and expertise um, and knowledge of the history and of the music and, you know, the, of the vocabulary and the technique. Um, but, then he, but then he could participate in a way that it didn't sound like a dumbed down version of what the musicians were doing. Nor did he yell, stop the band. I don't want to play what you're playing. I want to play what I want to play. He, he went with an open heart to join something that was bigger than himself. And they welcomed him because he was willing to emulate or attempt to emulate um, the practice of, of, of the experts. And, you know, I'm, I'll be thinking about that in lots of ways for a long time. Like, like for example, I'm playing with the idea of um, gifted or talented. Because um, I worked with super gifted kids, you know, kids who were doing cancer research at 10. Kids who had papers published at MIT at eight, you know, eight years old. Schools hate those kids. So, teachers super, were, super awesome teachers were, Sylvia. what's that? Super awesome, Sylvia. Right. Teachers are malicious towards those kids in a lot of cases. They're, they're antagonistic towards them. They spend every waking moment figuring out a way to test the kids to find something they don't know how to do to, to prove that they're not so smart. Um, and, and I'm, and I was thinking about kids who are talented are kind of, embraced they people think it's cool maybe it's because of the anti-intellectualism of the society or whatever but you know no one no one was putting down this 11 year old kid everyone wanted to you know everyone wants this kid to succeed beyond his wildest dreams we, we've gone off topic a little bit but i think it's all related to to creating an environment that's collegial that's that's non-coercive that that provides all the material support and intellectual and social support that to create a productive context for learning, um, which, That's which leads to, That's great. yeah, I mean, which, uh, and that notion of productive context for learning is a direct lift from Seymour Saracen, who's someone, if you have, I've turned Will Richardson onto Seymour Saracen and he's been crapping on endlessly about him for the last few years, but um, heavy stuff. He was a psychologist who literally in the 1950s contributed the idea that your context influences learning and your behavior, which is like the idea that that was, that's only a 60 or 70 year old idea is kind of mind blowing. Um, How do you spell his last name? Out of curiosity. Seymour. S-A-R-S-S-A-R-A-S-O-N. Okay. Got it. Um, he, he wrote books. He wrote books like 30 years ago with titles like the predictable failure of school reform. Um, one, a, a really good one I recommend to start with is there's a book called What Do You Mean by Learning? Um, but anyway, um, so let me, let me segue into CMK for a couple yeah. minutes and then yeah. we'll take questions or unless oh, people want to take, ask me questions now or you want to take some questions why, now. And why, then you, I can... why don't you go into CMK and then we'll, we'll wrap up with questions. Um, I put okay. in the chat. There's also so, everyone that I put in, um, in the announcement yesterday that Gary sent along too, by the way. Okay. Yeah, and I, and I sent you an article that I just wrote on PD for, for a magazine that was kind of concise. Um, so a dozen years ago or so, I was growing increasingly concerned, maybe even more than that, maybe going back to almost 20 years, that 
that the ed tech community wasn't giving enough thought to learning um, or to progressive education. I mean, the dirty little secret of everything I'm doing is it's just a way to try to create the best ideals of progressive education alive. Um, and I think computers are a way of, of constructing knowledge in the modern world that are consistent with the best principles of progressive education. Um, and that when I got involved in, in educational technology, Lucy, the ed tech conferences were where the smartest people on the planet were. You couldn't go anywhere without running into someone who was the smartest person you ever met. And then and, I started going to them and dumbed them down. No. <laughs> it's just, it's just what happened. I mean, it's, you know, it's now a boat show and it's, and it's 27 cute tricks and, and you know, the 27 cute tricks sessions have a place. They have a place in the school district's PD program. They don't have a place at a national or international conference. Um, but, uh, that was a concern. The other concern was whenever my heroes, Ted Sizer, Alfie Cohn, Deborah Meyer, folks like that, Jonathan Kozel, were asked about computers, they would say dopey things. And Seymour Papper and I used to have a lot of conversations about, can't we bring all these people together and have a conversation and let them see that what we're doing with computers isn't dystopian, it's not test-based, it's not, test based, um, it's not dehumanizing, it's actually designed to amplify human potential to enhance creativity um and no institution would do it no university would do it no no professional organization would do it so 12 years ago i i decided i would do it and i created a a four-day institute called constructing modern knowledge and basically the structure of it hasn't changed at all in in 11 years this will be our 11th year it's july 10th through 13th you can learn all about the event at constructingmodernknowledge.com but what we've done is create an environment where teachers have the luxury of time for four days to work with a mountain of materials. Last year, we shipped 60 cases of stuff, not just high tech materials. I shipped five or 600 books. We build a library. We have art supplies and craft materials and toys and junk and Super Bowls and silly putty. Anything that anyone might need within arm's reach to, to enhance their project. And we start with a ritual that's a, a version of something I learned from two of my mentors, Dan and Molly Watt, in the mid-80s, where we ask people what, what you want to make. We don't, we don't say, what do you want to learn? Do you want to learn to use Photoshop? Do you want to – we say, what do you want to make? And people yell out all kinds of crazy ideas, and we write them all down on the wall. And, and then we say, okay, now come up and grab a marker and write your name down under any of these projects that interest you. You're – this – this is not a contract. You're not committing to anything. And then people look at all these names and there might be 300 project ideas and only 200 people. And they start seeing how some of them might connect. And, but we don't even talk about that very much. Then we didn't say, grab a piece of paper. And if you're really hot on, on an idea for a project, write the name of that project down on a piece of paper, spread out in this giant space we have and hold the page above your head with the, the, the name of the, the project you have. You know, some guy two years ago said he wanted to make massage shorts and I dropped the mic and, and he came up to me later and he said, you know, you made my idea sound dirty. I said, with all due respect, sir, you said you wanted to make massage shorts, but if he wants to write massage shorts and put it, hold it up on a sign, anyone who's then interested in working on that project can join him. And then we don't talk to them again. There's no more direct instruction. We have a fabulous faculty of some of the most gifted educators and technology innovators in the world who support people in their project development. And we go to the MIT Media Lab one evening for a reception and then people get a few hours to run around Boston. But once a day, people have conversations with, with great thinkers. There's always an incredible educator. We've had all of them. We've had Deborah Meyer and Alfie Cohen. And this year we have Carlo Rinaldi who's been running the, the municipal preschools of Reggio Emilia, Italy for the last 40 years. Um, she's the most profound, deeply thoughtful, soulful, beautiful educator I've ever encountered. Um, we've had Jonathan Kosel. We've had Lillian Katz. Um, I can, the list is long. And then we always have someone who's great with technology. We've had the inventor of Makey Makey and Circuit Stickers and, um, and Scratch. And, and then we and, – and Stephen Wolfram, the great mathematician, the creator of Mathematica and Wolfram Language and Wolfram Alpha. Um, and then we have – someone usually who's great at something that school doesn't value or that your guidance counselor didn't tell you was a career option. We've, we've had P 
Pete Nelson, the Treehouse Master. We had an 18-year-old guy who was the world's preeminent expert on Negro League baseball history. Um, we've had, you know, artists and jazz musicians and historians. So this year we have James Lowen, who's the author of Lies My Teacher Told Me, and as an expert on helping teachers understand how children um, can be historians rather than being taught history. We, he came to CMK eight or nine years ago and was talking about the Confederate monuments and how they don't, con they don't commemorate the Confederacy as much as they commemorate the, the time and the place of the people who put them up and the politics of that era. And that's all come to fruition now. So I thought it was timely to bring him back. We have Carlo Rinaldi. Um, we have um, G. Key, who created circuit stickers. Eric Rosenbaum was on the scratch team and he's co-inventor of the Makey Makey. And, oh, and Paulie DeMeo, who was the carpenter on um, TV's Extreme Home Makeover. Um, and we, we asked the speakers to actually spend time with, with, with the participants as well. And there's no, there's no moment that gives me greater joy than the look on a teacher's face when they're building a robot or something. And they look over their shoulder and Jonathan Kozel's watching them or the teacher who nearly fainted when Alfie Cohen sat down next to her last year. Um, or I, I nearly cried when a, when a teach, when I said to a teacher after our night in Boston, Hey, what'd you do tonight? And she said, well, I went for soup dumplings at the place that I took Carlo Rinaldi to last year. And the idea that these teachers could spend informal time with people that they admire, whether they knew about them at all beforehand, um, really, really moves me. And over and over and over again, teachers create stuff in four days that takes my breath away. Stuff that couldn't possibly have resulted from direct instruction. Uh, I'll give you a couple of examples. I know we're close to time, so let me do this quickly. Um, we had a group of teachers this year who created Fitbit shoes. They made shoes that when you, they counted your steps, and every 50 steps, there was a little light up dance party in your shoes. And they didn't make a prototype of these things. They made the thing. We had a group two years ago who, who said they wanted to make Pokemon Go. And this was a great moment for me as a teacher. This was five days after Pokemon Go came out. And you remember the entire world was looking around, staring at their phones. And the media was breathlessly telling us about how the smartest engineers in the universe had created this remarkable software that was going to revolutionize everything. And these teachers said they wanted to make Pokemon Go. And we wrote it on the wall. And a voice in my head said, they're not going to be able to do it. How could they possibly create this thing? We've been told how impossibly complex it is. My, my experience, my heart said to me, shut up, keep your mouth closed, because maybe they'll be successful. And if they're not successful, they'll modulate their expectations. And they'll come up with an equally worthy project that they can be successful at. Well, 10 minutes into CMK, someone said to their group, are you familiar with Tailblazer? There's a version of Scratch, a block-based programming language that has a GPS block in it. And if you have a block that tells you where you are on the globe, it's trivial to create your own Pokemon Go. So these teachers, not only seven days after Pokemon Go was invented, made a credible version of their own for the local community, but they had so much extra time on their hands, they made one for our institute. So when you walked up to someone's project, it told you what you were looking at, who worked on it, any related information might be of interest to you. We've had people make giant dragons with light up eyes that four people could control. We've had ecosystems, weather systems created where it rained and thunder and crazy stuff in the classroom. We've had movies made. We've had automata. We've, and um, we had someone make a balloon powered drone last year that over and over and over again, we have groups, we have projects that have 10 or 12 people working on them. And we have other projects where someone just sits by themselves in a corner quietly for four days and works out on their own. And we hope that by seeing all of the different kinds of things that could be made, all of the ex different kinds of learning experiences people have, that teachers will construct their own idea of, of what this means for their own practice. Even just the idea of why do you have a treehouse designer, the world's best early childhood educator, and the world's most important living mathematician all speaking at the same event to the same audience? Um, 
that sort of making sense of what those people have to do with one another, I think is an important experience for teachers. Um, I think one of the greatest problems facing education is that teachers are unfamiliar with what greatness feels like, tastes like, smells like, looks like. And as a result, they have kind of lowered their expectations to sort of mechanistic rituals as opposed to recognizing what it real what the conditions um the conditions that are required to allow kids to solve problems that their teachers never anticipated and and to achieve to an extent that that we can't even we can't even imagine so when a teacher has done this themselves and they're surrounded by people all doing things like this and when they can go from group to group or they can decide a pro an idea is terrible and start over or have it morph into something else or combine with another team without asking for permission without intervention they can spend an extra 10 minutes at lunch without someone looking at scans at them when they come back i think all of that has a profound impact on on, on what they do when they return to their classrooms. And that's why I, I keep doing it 11 years on. So let me take some questions and shut up at this point. Okay, then, this is really great. Cause I think, um, I think this is all about kind of letting go of control a little bit. And um, it, it's about giving people the tools and experiences and the, the building blocks. And then they build, they make their own meaning out of it. They make the most of the experience. Right, yeah. with, the right, with the right building blocks, you can build anything, right? Yeah, so I think this is like, I, I think it's, 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 not, it's not radical, but I think we've gotten so far away from this. We feel like we have to deliver and that we have to impart and we have to, and it's really not, um, I, I, I think the further I get away with this with my own workshops, the, the least, um, uh, it just doesn't feel natural to me. I had three different experiences at FETC and I think I was moaning to Sylvia about how I felt about our first, we did a workshop that was, we didn't tell so many people were coming. There were a lot in a big, huge room. It was me and Karen Blumberg. And, uh, and if we'd been with a smaller group, we'd be more relaxed about it and uh, allowing things to happen, it would have been a better experience. The next day I had six people in my workshop and it was much more exploration based and went 15 million times better. And then um, the last one was similar where it was more of a fire hose thing, but it went okay. Um, but I, I, I think that we've gotten so far away from this because we feel like we have to impart all of our knowledge and give people their money's worth and at conferences and, and going into schools and that sort of thing, and that just doesn't work. I also think this is part of the problem with getting buy-in in schools. We wonder why our teachers don't come to our after-school stuff. I mean, this is a perennial problem I had 20 years ago at lab. Or yep. at lab. Um, and it's about creating the circumstances that make people want to be there. And it, and that's also true for kids too. When you create oh, yeah. circumstances for kids, then, then sky's the limit. So I'm just kind of synthesizing this in my own brain. Um, yeah, and there's, and, there's, and there's practical aspects of it, too. I mean, I, I'm always amazed when people say to me, well, you know, teachers are afraid of not knowing everything. And I just laugh at them now. I said, who told you you did? I mean, it, it's such a preposterous idea that you know everything. Like, just abandon that, for God's sakes. Um, and I, I think that as teachers, if you ask teachers what they're good at, a lot of them will just tell you teaching. Okay, so let's say that's a thing. Let's stipulate that that's a thing. Um, and Sylvia helped me with this in conversation many years ago. Um, t the kids only, or the, your teachers in your PD sessions, only gain the benefit of that expertise to the extent that you make it as transparent as possible. Right? And, and so, you know, I was in Zurich last week, and I tried something new in my workshop. And I said at the outset, this could be a terrible idea. And, but I'm going to try to do this. And, and I said to them after lunch, I said, that was a, now I'm wrestling with, was that a terrible idea or am I just really bad at it? Um, and I made that sort of transparent to them. And the next day I did this, I did it differently. Um, but I'll keep wrestling with, I think there was enough in the idea to, 
to hold on to it for a little while longer to see if I can be better at tweaking it. Um, but I mean, here, here's an outrageous idea. I've, one of my mentors in Australia, a guy named Bernard Newsom, says that all educational ideas, good, bad, and different, it doesn't matter what they are, have a five-year lifespan. The first year or two, you know, professional teachers, you know, well-meaning folks will give something a go and they'll try to become good at it, right? And then the third or fourth year, it kind of hums along. If they don't have enough intellectual or emotional investment in it, by the fifth year, the winds blow, you get a new principal, there's some new fads, something, it goes out the window. Um, so if you think something is, is valuable, I think you need to, first of all, recognize that life cycle, but also try to create the conditions um, in which the teachers understand and love the, va the value of, see and love the value of the thing enough to fight to keep it alive. So, I mean, I, I've, been, I've been teaching Logo for 35 years. I, I still find plenty of merit and, and joy and power in it. And every time I use it with kids, the exact same thing happens. There's this explosion of, of, ex, of intellectual excitement and curiosity and, um, and sense of accomplishment. So no one is going to knock that out of my bag of tricks just because, you know, some, something external happened in the school. We've talked, you know, one of our modules for this course has been on change management and which is a whole other bag of worms, but um, you could spend a whole course, you know, just yeah. that. that. Um, but I think one of the things is that I think uh, that I tried to mention in my comments to my students was that, it, you know, the success of something shouldn't be dependent on, of an of a innovation initiative in a district shouldn't be dependent on one person. It shouldn't be dependent on the, yes, you need the administration to buy in, you need that superintendent to, to really believe in it. But if that superintendent or that principal or whomever leaves, you don't want the going, whatever you're doing, go to go out the window with them. It has to be a whole community. And that's, that it's buying into it and sees the value and sees the benefit for kids, which I'm really glad you reminded us of that tonight because I think that often gets lost in the rhetoric. Um, well, I think, a lot of the, I think a lot of the discussions about change today are, are just discussions. I think they're they're often led by people who haven't changed anything. Yeah, I mean, true. you know, sh show me what you've done. Right? I mean, show me who you fought to to make something different. You know, show me show me your scars. First of all, second of all, it's looking at the problem through the wrong end of the telescope. Um, we have to improve the relationship between teacher and kid, and we have to recognize that since about the mid 80s, we've, re we've removed the art of teaching from teacher preparation. And all that we've left is, if you want, the science of teaching, which is essentially curriculum delivery and animal control. And we've got a generation of teachers who don't know how to do this stuff we're talking about. So when I, when I bring Cuisinaire rods into a classroom and a veteran teacher says, oh my God, Cuisinaire rods. I love Cuisinaire rods. Gladys, you remember when we had Cuisinaire rods? The kids used to learn all the math and we used to do all these great activities. And I'll just simply say, what happened to them? And a teacher will say, oh, no, they got rid of them. Who's they? You know, some of this stuff, you should you know, have to pry it out of my cold, dead hand. If, if I think this is valuable for kids, I should be able to keep doing it, which is, which is the sort of the nature of what makes us a professional to the extent that we're professionals. But we need to recognize that there's an awful lot that needs to be covered. You know, I took for granted that teachers knew about classroom centers. The idea is that kids can be working independently on projects without you, you know, operatically speaking for from bell to bell or choreographing every moment of what happened in the classroom. Um, but that was a that was a wrong assumption. There's a generation of teachers who have no experience with that. Yeah, I so I we so, by that. so what's that? I would not be shocked by that. I think I think we're all over the place in terms of, um, particularly with ed tech, but I also think in terms of uh, vision for education, uh, you know, and I, I maybe it's impossible to expect. I don't want everybody to be the same, but I want everybody to have some commonalities when they're talking about education and what's important and, and the history of education. Yeah, but the only, they, they can only do that if they have experience. I come back to what I said at the beginning. Knowledge is the consequence of experience. So what the change discussions do is that they have this they have this discussion that's divorced from experience, which just makes it rhetoric. Um, and 
And we ought to be able to say that not enough teachers know enough about teaching to make that, to, to have that not be dismissed as teacher bashing. Yeah. Right. I, that, I wanna, that might, the, I want to you know, my musician, a go ahead. Questions. Okay. Cause yeah, I, please. I yeah, yeah, please, please. I got, I'm I got all the time. Go ahead. I want them to go ahead. Um, anybody want to grab the mic and ask um, Gary a question? I would love for you guys to, to, to either agree, disagree, or ask them a question. Don't be afraid, the clown's afraid too. Either they're stunned or they can't figure out how to use the software. Okay, so I'll jump in. I don't really have a question, but yeah. I just hi, Laura. say hi. I just wanted to say that I've enjoyed listening to you talk. Um, I can't say that I um, completely uh, disagree with just about anything you say. Um, actually, what, what resonated with me a lot was um, your comment about the gifted versus talented, yeah. um, how teachers approach. And so I was thinking about in terms of when I have my own classroom and, um, you know, we had the talented pool, the gifted pool. And, and I, it just, it, a lot of what you say has resonated with me. <laughs> um, I guess I just wonder how, how then do you, I mean, if, if we're all over the map and, you know, you say we should be treated, teachers should be treated with, you know, respect and this idea that, that they can, um, they can grow and, you know, help inspire their students. How, how do we, how do we get to that place? And how do we get to that place in being all over the map with technology and, um, our political system and you know like how to you know, solve all these problems tonight but no i just i guess i want to know how just from pd standpoint yeah. how, do, how do you get teachers um to have the same vision how do you get people on board i i, I don't find that to be that big a challenge i think um yeah you know Either Seymour Papert or E.D. Harrell are responsible for this quote. It's not clear which one originated it. But that's, it's okay to worry about what I do, what you're going to do Monday, if what you do Monday points in the direction of what you hope to do someday. Um, the problem with a lot of what we do that's incremental is that it often takes us in a direction that's, that's, that sort of meanders or that is – as a detour from what where where you hope to go someday, um, to a certain extent, maybe we got to stop talking about vision for a while. <laughs> maybe we should just try to get better at what we do. Um, again, I've learned more about learning from some of the world's great jazz musicians. It's not insulting to say to them, "Hey, you better spend the rest of your life getting better at the trumpet." That's what they do. That's why they wake up in the morning. That's, you know, that's who they are. And the idea that teachers are different in some way, that they're immune from criticism, that, 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 they're, that, they're, fully, that they're fully formed is, is kind of preposterous. And to a certain extent, I think we should hold a mirror up to them and call, call BS on that. But at the same time, um, we should in a respectful, loving way, help them become better at what they do. Like I said, I think all these discussions about educational leadership and transformation and change are looking at the, the, the problem through the wrong end of the telescope. It, unless we help people teach better, unless, what we, unless we change what happens in classrooms, um, the vision stuff is just empty rhetoric. And it, and it may not be the right vision because again, Knowledge is a consequence of experience. I think vision is a consequence of seeing what's possible and then extrapolating what you might what you might shoot for down the road. So you could think of that as a project as well. I think the project should be the teacher's smallest unit of concern. So if as a teacher, I'm trying to get better at doing X, by the time I get reasonably competent at X, I hopefully have an idea of what Y is. 
that 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 I don't need to be told by someone else what that is. I I intrinsically know what what I what I'm interested in, what 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 lays what what lies before me that can that can continue to be learned. Sorry to get philosophical. No, it's good. This is good. This is deep. Um, anybody else want to shoot one more question before we wrap up? Because I know everybody has a life that they need to get on to. But I'm wondering if we can, if I can grab one more question out of you guys or observation that you'd like to share with Gary. I don't have a question. Um, I just wanted to make a comment sort of about sure. your uh, CMK and how yep. I'm doing something um, kind of similar with my students where I sort of take a step back and I have them do a project on their passion. And um, it's the time in my classroom where these kids come to life. And mm -hmm. it just really hit home that you do this four day institute and been doing it for so long and it's been working so well. I'm like, it's something in my classroom that I see come to life as well, even with the kids. And it's just very eye opening. Go, good, so find, find a way to do more of it. Because, uh, uh, you know, the novel, the, the, you know, there's a lot of benefit from it being novel, right? That it's a different thing from what happens the rest of the time in school. But um, my challenge to you would be to find a way to, to make that more of the norm and less, less of the exception to what happens in the classroom to the, ex to, the greater, to the greatest extent possible. Recognizing that, you know, you have things you have to teach and people watch you and all that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, if I have any particular talent um, or gift or insight as, a, as an educator, um, it goes way back. Well, as a kid, I realized very early on in school that a whole lot of this stuff that a whole lot of people are terribly worried about doesn't matter very much. And a lot of what I do as an educator is, is, is sort of strip away all of the things that lots of people are terribly agitated about that, that I don't really have very much interest in. Um, and that doesn't mean I'm shirking my responsibility. I, I actually have higher standards than what most curricula expect of teachers and kids. Um, but it, it, it sort of reduces the level of panic and, and, and frenetic sort of swinging from extreme to extreme. And, you know, I, I always say to kids, I'm not good at that, like lining up and shushing down the hall stuff, like, or, you know, just go to the library. Don't interrupt anybody. You know, just, yeah. I, and I've been not lucky enough to work in schools where you can tell four-year-olds to go to the library and they do so without taking hostages or being murdered or disrupting other classes. And, and then I go to other schools where I see this 20 minute shush parade of kids lined up from shortest to tallest and boy, girl, boy, girl, and, and rules and punishments and all. And it's like, you didn't need any of that nonsense. You're just trying to go across the hallway. Um, so to, to the extent that you can reduce things to their smallest essence and recognizing that learning is natural and that, that knowledge results from having rich experiences, I think it sort of liberates you to, to have, uh, a, a more productive context for learning. And I'll just, I'll just end with this last anecdote because Lucy was talking about her workshops and you'll appreciate this, Lucy. The second day of my workshops in Zurich, I designed a brochure. I caught up on my email. I did some web design all during my workshop. And I told the people that I did that, you know, that, I sure i was goof i was goofing off i, I mean will, i was never i have to i I'll, I'll try that in india i'll try that at, at asp i'm sure that oh, will yeah i wouldn't try it there <laughs> <laughs> but i but but i i like i i think i'm most effective when i you know i often call it lawn chair teaching i've created the conditions where i tell people what is expected of them and they just go and i'm unnecessary there's nothing more exciting than when someone says, hey, Gary, can you come help me? And as I approach them, they wave me off. Go away, go away. I, you know, the solution came to them. And, and so I sat at a desk. I, I, I unplugged the monitor, for, you know, the projector from my computer, and I designed a brochure, and I worked on some web stuff, and I caught up on my email. And I helped people if they needed me and stuff. But I literally told them at the end of the workshop, like, by the way, this is all the work I did while you guys were doing all this learning. Um, and it was just sort of like a tongue-in-cheek way of saying, 
like, you know, I'm not the center of the freaking universe. The teacher is not the center of the freaking universe. They can create a context in which, in which learning occurs without, without direct instruction, without hectoring, without heckling. I think you're modeling, yeah, you're absolutely modeling it for them. And I like that. That's the quote of the night. Your teachers are not the center of the freaking universe. Um, we have a, a guy that dropped in. He saw me tweet about, um, about this, Wade Whitehead from Virginia. And he wanted to ask you a question. Wade, do, hey, you, Wade. Want to, do you want to jump in and ask one? If anybody has to go, go. Um, we're having a good time and we're talking. So we'll take one more question. Um, but anyway, uh, Wade, uh, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, Gary, can you hear me? Yeah, hi, how are you? Hey, I'm good. I haven't seen you in a long, long yeah, time. Yeah, no, I was just going to say that. What's up? Yeah, it's good to hear your voice. Uh, and I just saw this on Twitter and popped in. So um, thanks for doing this. So here's a question. I, 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 I can guess what the possibilities might be, but tell me two specific working conditions that would have to exist for you to leave what you're doing now and become a public school classroom teacher? Oh, yeah. Um, well, I, I'd like to actually, I'd actually like to run a school, but um, if I think about that a lot, I would almost work for free under the condition that it's a really simple condition that you leave me alone. You can, you can measure what I do any way you want because I'm confident enough in what I do. Um, to, to know that I'll crush whatever stupid standard you have. Um, but if you want me to, but if you, but if you want me to, to teach for you, um, you, you're going to have to, just, you're going to have to leave me alone. And, you know, the best work that I've been ever been associated with my doctoral research was based on creating a high tech multi-age project based alternative learning environment inside a prison for teenagers in Maine a facility where, where Amnesty International was accusing the state of torturing kids. And and here we come as this band of hippies trying to create this loving environment for you know supporting collaboration and, and which which kids were actually punished for um, within the facility. And the only reason we were able to have any success with kids who had been previously dismissed as um, uneducable was that the governor and the legislature freed us of a, of curriculum and assessment requirements that. One, they had the political problem on their hands of they were being accused of torturing kids. And two, they actually had some interest in creating a model of what learning might look like in the future and recognized that doing more of the same loudly wasn't going to achieve a different result. Um, so that, that, so that's pretty much the only condition that would be required of me doing that. Now, now I'll tell you the, the, the flip side of that. You know, I wrote a magazine column for a dozen years and every piece of hate mail I received began with what was the last time you were in a classroom? And, and when someone asks that question, what they're really asking is, why aren't you miserable like me? And I don't need to be a martyr. I'm in, I'm in two or three classrooms a week all over the place. And what that actually gives me that a lot of teachers don't have is perspective. I get to see patterns emerging. When I see something in Mumbai, Melbourne, and Manhattan, within days of each other that no one's talking about. I know something's up and I start thinking about what the conditions were that created that phenomenon and what we're going to do about it. Um, and so I would love to be in a school. And in fact, I spent two years recently working in a school fairly regularly. Um, whenever I wasn't on the road, I was at the school and loved every second of it and wished it had never ended. Um, I, I would, I would, and I'm on the advisory board of a new startup school in Manhattan and I would, I would love to be in a school permanently, but I'm not interested in being a martyr. And um, being able to work with thousands of teachers a year and, and to deeply influence a pro probably a few hundred of them um, gives me an opportunity to, as the Boy Scouts would say, leave the campsite better than I found it. And I find that you know, satisfactory. I, I mean, I'll leave, I'll leave you on an optimistic note. You know, our book, Invent to Learn, Making Tinkering and Engineering in a Classroom, has outsold, outperformed our wildest dreams. And people say very nice things about it. And that's all, that's all very, very um, satisfying and, and humbling. Um, but it also has, has helped me recognize there's an awful lot of folks who want to do things differently. There's probably 50% of teachers. 
a younger version of myself would be would be really outraged by the other 50 percent and how come i can't reach them um perhaps with with maturity comes a comes a realization that i'm not going to be able to have that impact on everyone and we have two kinds of school systems that are being created wonderful play-based regio inspired montessori influenced constructivist um learning environments and obedient schools for other people's children um and and a giant gulf between them um but i'm i'm kind of working with the living and doing no harm and recognizing that there's an all there are a lot more folks who want for their kids, whether their own kids, their own children, or the students they serve, um, a different kind of more nutritious educational diet than what's currently on offer. And I'll do whatever I can to help those folks um, become better at what they do. That's awesome, Gary. Thank you. Thanks for the candor. Thanks for dropping in, Wade. Good to hear from yeah. you. Good to, good to see your face. Thanks, me. That was a great way to cap off this evening. Great answer, Gary. And um, you know, one of the things I've talked to my students about is that you can have, particularly with Laura, I think I've mentioned this a lot to her, is that I think that teachers should be able to kind of come and go from different kinds of environments. You shouldn't have to be stuck in a classroom for 40 years unless you really want to be there. Um, We're the only country in the world that's like that, by the way. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think you should have different career paths. You should be able to go be a, a tech coach done right or go be administrator then go back in the classroom or be a consultant and um but i i also have had uh, people say to me well you're not in the classroom anymore i had a school that wanted to hire me here in chicago that said well you haven't been in a classroom for three years and actually in those three years i've seen and done more than i would have yeah. been in a in a school building and it was really short-sighted so um i really believe in teachers having getting some perspective and, and young, te young teachers are getting bad advice, too. When I was doing teacher education, I would tell folks, you know, there's a good chance in this country you're going to retire in a classroom you started in. You better find somewhere you love. Um, that's one piece of advice. The second piece of advice, if you have any ambition to be in leadership, to whatever, you, ne you need to be moving at 35. You're not, at a prin you're not a principal track at 35. It's over for you. And, uh, you know, those of us of a certain age kind of might find it frustrating, but there's an awful lot of ageism in the field. Oh, totally. And, and there's, you know, the only way I'm getting another university job or I'll ever lead a school, which is what I really want to do is if someone just says, come do it. Right. But there's, there's not a job that I can apply for that. I mean, you know, I, I applied for ed tech faculty jobs with, with, you know, people who had never heard of me, who obviously hadn't bothered even to Google, who would ask, tell me, can you use the PowerPoint? That was actually <laughs> a question I was asked. Um, you know, and I'm thinking, yeah, this is not going so well. So, you know, at, 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 at this point in my career, the only way I'm going to be able to work in the system is if, if some angel comes along and says, right, I'm giving you a school, I'm going to leave you alone, or we'd like to endow a chair and put you in it. But uh, I'm going to find a job on the web and apply for it and get, and get it. Not going to happen in a million years. So if you're in the system, and by the way, and if you want to have an impact, you have to seriously think about becoming an administrator. For every person who tells me, oh, I don't want to be a principal, all oh, this is paperwork. I know principals who teach every day, who know the names of every kid, who love their jobs, who, who, who play ball at recess with kids. That, that's you can shape the kind of administrative career you want to have. But if you really want, want the things to be different, you have to be willing to step up and say, I'm going to lead. And if you want to do that, you have to be on that path by your mid thirties. That's excellent advice. Excellent advice. And don't take any job that has the word coach in it. <laughs> you know, well, one of the things in this program is that they are, they, there are two tracks. One is for teachers who want to just integrate technology in their classroom teaching, and the other track is for tech coaching. So you're speaking to the wrong audience on that one. But, no, uh, I'll, that, I'll stand by that. I, 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 think, I, I, think it's a I think it's a term that's, that marginalizes you. I don't think it's, I don't think it's uplifting. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's, uh, you know, I, I don't think tech, I think it's what tech, tech directors were a while ago. But now tech directors are more managers of the boxes and wires and bureaucracy. Whatever, yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, I, I just, I just, I just think you ought to re you know, think about whether you want that title in your, I mean, sometimes people say, you know, what would be better and we can brainstorm other titles and stuff, but I, I don't think that's a particularly, particularly good one. Yeah. And I have friends who have been in jobs. Uh, we have a mutual friend who they changed his title to that. And I said, it's unacceptable. I said, you don't even want to argue the merits of it. They just violated their contract with you. You need to get it, get it fixed. Cause so all of a sudden, you know, you've, you've gone from a teacher or leadership position to something that sounds like, you know, custodian um, or someone who inflates, inflates balls after school or something. And I think, I think it, it and it's, and it's to a certain extent, enabling helplessness again we're 40 freaking years into this how much more coaching do teachers need enough already maybe maybe the reason why teachers don't use computers in schools is because they don't work so you know i mean this is add on to this this is a whole other can of worms i'm sure i will open but um I met Betsy Corcoran from Ed Surge. Um, I don't know, pre Ed Surge. Somebody introduced us that um, that knew both of us, and she at the time was a Silicon Valley bureau chief for, or she had she had just finished being like the Silicon Valley bureau chief for Forbes or something, and she was looking at her kids' use of technology in their classrooms and what their teachers were doing, and her kids are about my kids' age. They're um, one's a little bit yeah. older. And um, she, re she thought that maybe it dawned on her that maybe we were at this pivotal moment that where, you know, business had finally caught on to using technology and it was not acceptable to not use technology anymore in, in business. For It's been that way for a while. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, tech not, maybe education was getting to that same point. And I, I, I don't know, that was probably five, seven years ago. I don't know if that's necessarily really changed. It's not about the technology usage. It's about using it in interesting, creative, authentic ways. And so, anyway, so I, I don't know if we're at it. I don't think, I, I, we, I, we, we're kind of, we're kind of uh, treading water is how yeah, I. Yes, so, and that's why I'm saying don't, you know, don't buy any more floaties. Um, you know, what, in 1989, my friend David Loader said, Next year, we'll have a laptop for every kid in our school. And he changed the world. And the reason why they were going to have a laptop for every kid was to work on projects. They were going to program across the curriculum. They were using Logo Writer at the time. It revolutionized everything in the school. It led to the whole concept of one-to-one -one in education. It was never a pilot, a project, an experiment. He said, we're going to do it. And he did it with his existing staff. And the, if, you put a pin in, if you put pins in a map of where those teachers went around the world, from people who got PhDs to people who became school principals, to people who started companies who, 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 who went on to leadership positions in other schools. It's quite extraordinary. And it wasn't, it, there, was ne, there was no, what do you want to do or how, it was, he, he recognized that he wanted to help make pro, a progressive vision of people like Papert's come alive in his school. He, he was on airplanes and he saw people increasingly carrying portable computers with them, with them. And he said, why wouldn't we do this for kids? And, and so there was just a leader who said, this is what's going to happen. And then he did whatever was necessary to support that, that coming to fruition. Um, I, it's way past the having to make the case or to, to prove. The only stuff we're ever, ever asked to justify in education are things that kids like. No one's ever asked to defend graphing calculators or spelling tests or phonics, um, or desks in rows. We're always asked to justify laptops, or projects, or field trips, or band, or music, or art. Um, and, and so I don't even entertain those discussions anymore. If someone says to me, is there evidence of blah, 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 it's not a sincere question. There's not enough, there's not anything I could tell them that would, that would satisfy them. Look, I'm gonna pull a book off my bookshelf. This is a doctoral dissertation published in 1992 uh, of demonstrating the efficacy of laptop for every child, right? It's 25, 26 years old. Is there evidence? Yeah, mountains of it. But someone who asks that question, it is just wasting your time because there's no answer you could provide that's going to that's going to satisfy them. They just want to bust your balls and and justify um, justify whatever their notion of the status quo is. 
I agree. Those of us who know better need to do better and we need to share it with others. And I think that that's consistent with, with high quality professional development. That's the perfect end cap to a great talk. So thank you. We've had seven of them. So I'm going to stop there. You nailed it. You nailed it. <laughs>